Welcome again to the Auditorium Maximum. It's 1 o'clock, it's 1 p.m. And I'm sure more people will be joining us later on, but let us get started with the first plenary session, which will be about revolution and a crisis in science, the learnings from the past and a look into the future. This discussion will be moderated by Reverend Professor Wojciech Grigel of the John Paul II University in Kraków. And our panel members include Professor Helge Krach of the University of Aarhus, Professor Andrzej Jajszczyk of the Krakow University of Science and Technology, and Professor Lydia Morawska of Queensland University of Technology. Please stay with us with, for the panel discussion. Panel, it's my great pleasure to uh, be a host of this panel. As it was announced, I represent the Pontifical University of uh, John Paul II in Krakow. And uh, together with me today, I have a, a very distinguished guests. And I, and I have to say uh, that as we come to the topic of uh, revolution and crisis in science, we are a very mixed bunch here in the sense that every one of us represents a considerably different point of view uh, from the, how we practice science, what is our experience of science. So I think this adds to uh, the quality of our discussion because we will be able to approach this topic from very uh, different perspectives and then maybe to, uh, later on to establish some common uh, points. Uh, so let me be, uh, say a bit more about who is who. Uh, here are my list and on the slide first I have Professor Helge Krak from Denmark, from the Niels Bohr Institute, who is a famous historian of science. Uh, he authored a book on Paul Dirac and also co-authored the Oxford Handbook of the History of Modern Cosmology. So here we have a historian of science a very seasoned historian of science, so that's one point of view. Uh, two other points of view, I think, are, uh, are practical, because uh, Professor Andrzej uh, Jajszczyk, who comes from the AGH University, as we're supposed to say now, I guess, here in Krakow, and he is the, uh, an engineer and a specialist in telecommunication and in communication networks. And then we have Professor Lydia Morawska, who comes to us from all the way from Australia, from Brisbane. And uh, she's actually uh, very much uh, uh, associated with Jagiellonian because she received her PhD in physics from Jagiellonian University. But today she works uh, in Australia and uh, her focus is air quality, and especially its impact on health and environment. So with this uh, mixed views, I think we have a great uh, opportunity to really take up a discussion on what it means that we have uh, revolution in science, what it means that we have crisis in science, and what, the le what, what are the lessons from it, both from the past and into the future. Uh, and I, as far as myself, uh, I also was a practicing scientist at some point. I was a chemist. I blew up a few things in my life, but then I moved over to philosophy and theology, which is a bit quieter, but uh, still I think I represent a point of more philosophers. So we have, as I say, uh, a very mixed and very interesting combination of, of speakers. Uh, our topic is extremely broad and uh, the amount of literature on revolutions in science, the amount of literature on crisis in science, the amount of uh, literature where science is heading in, is enormous, and we all know that. So in order to, um, obtain, to get some focus, I uh, decided to uh, ask a question, because the way we will proceed here, I will ask each and every one of you to uh, express your views on the topic for about 10 minutes, then we will kind of engage in an exchange among the three of us, and then we will mo move over to get questions from audience. So that's basically the plan of our, uh, how we would like to proceed. And uh, well, if we have a topic, revolution and crisis in science and what it, what it is teaching us, I think uh, what immediately comes to mind is 
is there really anything that governs the progress of science? Is science uh, just a random enterprise uh, governed by chance or by some social uh, conditions? Uh, or is science something that is governed by an internal, some internal factors, some internal uh, criteria of development? Is it really is science really a, a social thing or it's really telling us something about the reality, telling us some, something about the universe? I think these are, because if we come to a crisis in science, then r really in science then something sometimes gets denied or, or there is a doubt placed. For instance, if you, I mean, you observe this, even if Einstein formulated his theory of relativity, general theory of relativity, it also, uh, it gave a gay progress in science, but at the same point, uh, we saw that there are singularities. So with the development of science, with a revolution, we also had a crisis in hand. So uh, let's, just by maybe focusing on these uh, major question whether science has any logic to it, has any rationality, uh, handle the question on uh, what are our views on revolution and, uh, and crisis in science and what it is really telling us. And I think we shall proceed in the order which is displayed on the screen. And as the first one, I'll ask Professor Helge Krag to share with us his views on the topic. Professor Krag, please. Uh, okay. I, given, that, given that this is a celebration event in honor of Copernicus, Okay, uh, I thought that it would be appropriate to call attention to a, an expression which is associated with his name, uh, namely the so-called Copernican revolution phrase. I'm sure that you all have met this phrase, uh, a phrase which is very common and is not only used uh, with reference to Copernicus heliocentric theory, but also used in general as a very radical uh, change in people's conception of whatever it can be. I would like to point out that although uh, the Copernican revolution was a very real phenomenon and it was re revolutionary, then Copernicus himself was not a revolutionary mind and he did not consider himself to be a revolutionary. On the very contrary, he was deeply conservative, and the very aim of his, what came to be the construction of a heliocentric cosmology, uh, was that Copernicus wanted to restore the virtues and the criteria of original astronomy with all the celestial bodies moving in perfect circles and so on. And it was out of this kind of conservatism that his revolutionary theory uh, emerged. So he was, in a sense, uh, a revolutionary against his will, as he has been called, and he's not the only great scientist who has created something revolutionary without wanting that to be the case. I may uh, refer to what is probably uh, one of the most important and revolutionary theories in the entire history of science in the newer period, namely quantum mechanics. Uh, as it's well known, this theory had its origin in the year 1900, when Max Planck in Germany introduced the hypothesis of energy quantization. Max Planck was deeply conservative. He really loved classical physics, and he had no intention whatsoever to, con to uh, construct a break with classical physics. But of course, that is what happened eventually, and in two years' time, we are able and will uh, celebrate the centenary of quantum mechanics with all its amazing consequences, philosophically, epistemically, and so on. Now, uh, the term Copernican revolution is what linguists call an eponym, meaning a name or a phrase which are given in honor of some person, preferably a great scientist. I would like very briefly to point out two other eponyms uh, associated with the name of Copernicus. 
it may come as a surprise to some of you that one of the chemical elements in the periodic table is named after Copernicus. I think it's atomic number 112 or thereabout. A very short-lived artificial element, but its name is Copernicus. Copernic, Copernicium, chemical symbol CP. Or more relevance, uh, there is a term used by cosmologists, even today, but it is a 20th century invention, which is called the Copernican principle. Uh, and that is a strange principle because it's very un-Copernican. The Copernican principle is a verse, is basically the same as the so-called cosmological principle, which states that there's no privileged place or location in the universe. That the universe looks the same wherever you are on a very large scale. It follows, of course, that there cannot be any center in the universe. That's a nonsensical uh, notion given the Copernican principle. But ironically, of course, Copernicus argued that there is a center in the universe. His cosmology was not geocentric, but it was centric. It was heliocentric. So in other words, Cosm uh, Copernicus's cosmology disagreed flatly with the Copernican principle. Whether or not the Copernican revolution is an appropriate term, I'm not sure that it is, it became well known and generally used uh, when Thomas Kuhn, in 1958, published a monograph with that very title, The Copernican Revolution. Kuhn's work on Copernicus is very interesting, but it's particularly interesting because it served as a kind of blueprint and inspiration for the work he published four years later, his famous and very, very influential book, The Structure of Scientific Re Re Revolutions. In that book, of course, uh, he uh, argued the controversial claim that mature science develops through a series of paradigm shifts, as he called them, and he said about these paradigm shifts that they were incommensurable which is a very strong claim because uh, it, it, it implies that uh, two different, when a certain paradigm is, um, is abandoned, it is, is replaced by a new paradigm, then the two paradigms cannot be compared rationally. Um, they have different epistemic values, they do not speak the same language, and for this reason, they cannot be uh, compared, and we cannot even say that, that the change from one paradigm to another is followed by a progress, because the very notion of pro scientific progress is limited to normal science within a given, um, uh, a given paradigm. The question of whether Kuhn's description, or his original 1962 description of the nature of science is reasonable if it's a fair picture of how, how science has actually developed, such as documented by the history of science, will presumably turn up in our latest discussion. So for that reason, I will not say more about it, apart from indicating that in my view, and I am a historian of science, in my view, there is no strong evidence, in fact, there's no evidence at all for paradigm shift in this uh, radical sense of that Kuhn uh, originally argued, there's no incommensurability with uh, different theories, but perhaps we'll come to that. I would like to end my brief introductory remarks by pointing out that, of course, there have been later revolutionary changes, and there have been quite a lot of them, depending on how you define re re revolution. Uh, think about the so-called chemical revolution in the Enlightenment period with Lavoisier. Think about the Davinian re revolution, and so on. But when it comes to cosmology, there has also been what is sometimes called a second Copernican re revolution. Uh, but that, then we have to go to the 20th century I'll just very briefly mention 
that something terribly important happened in cosmology. In a certain sense, scientific cosmology, from our standards, is a product of the 20th century and has little to do with what Copernicus did. Um, but think about what happened uh, about 1930. People uh, realized that the universe as a whole is not static, it's expanding, which came quite as a shock to many people. A few years later, we had the first idea that if the universe is, is expanding, then it's probably expanding from something with a, with a definite position in the past. That is, we have the first idea of the Big Bang universe, if not the term Big Bang, because that came later. And much later again, only 20, 25 years ago, uh, people discovered that not only is the universe expanding, it is expanding at an increased rate. In other words, it's accelerating. And to account for this acceleration of the universe, people had to invoke a quite new, a very, very important concept called dark energy, which is not completely understood yet. The last uh, result, perhaps, of this so-called revolution in cosmology is much more speculative. Uh, that is the, uh, the idea of the so-called multiverse, the speculative claim that not only is there one universe, the one that we have empirical access to, but there is a multitude, perhaps infinitely many other universes, and that these universes have different natural laws and constants than we have in our universe. This is indeed a radical claim, I will even say much more radical than the original one of Copernicus. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now uh, we, uh, we will hear Professor Andrzej Jajszczyk and his approach to revolutions in science. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to say some words about curiosity-driven research and revolutions associated with that. So we know that the research landscape has considerably changed over the years. Yeah. In Copernicus times, researchers used to work individually, sometimes exchanging their ideas uh, with a very limited number of colleagues. We know that Copernicus worked alone except for a brief period of cooperation with Retic. Over centuries that followed, scientists and scholars uh, did their research individually, or sometimes with a small group of junior researchers, usually very students. The change came in the 19th century. Larger groups of researchers were formed uh, just to cope with more complex problems. And the second half of the 19th century, in that second half, the American inventor, Thomas Alva Edison, established in Menlo Park, New Jersey, the first modern research laboratory. Uh, it was a real revolution. Uh, numerous research labs were created later on around the world, especially in the 20th century, some of them were of an impressive size. You know, for example, Bell Laboratories in Homedale, New Jersey, uh, people with whom I worked at some point, employed around 10,000 researchers. Of course, this does not mean that, that all those people worked on the same topic. Yeah? Uh, in fact, they were assembled in lots of smaller groups solving separate problems. The point is that the great ideas are born in single brains. In my opinion, one of the major sources of progress in science is the curiosity-driven research of talented individuals. The general public usually tends to associate uh, that progress in science with some practical inventions changing our lives such as steam or combustion engines, radio, or closer to our times, the internet, solar telephony, or the global positioning system. 
I'm using examples from, say, my own work. But none of those inventions would be possible without early developments in fundamental or basic science. We wouldn't have combustion engines without understanding basic thermodynamic phenomena. Electrical motors without knowledge of key principles of electromagnetism. Or Marconi's radio without a set of equations derived by James Clerk Maxwell, who theoretically predicted electromagnetic waves many years earlier. So Professor Heller presented uh, in one of his slides four equations associated with the names of uh, Maxwell. Uh, so these were a very important set of equations. Frankly speaking, uh, those equations called now Maxwell equations were, uh, say, constructed, <laughs> uh, devised by Heaviside, uh, but because Maxwell uh, composed a set of 23 or so equations. But generally, the idea is uh, the idea of Maxwell. So we have to remember that Maxwell did that. He composed those equations using, by using purely mathematical approach uh, without any practical applications in mind. So we can talk here about a sort of silent or delayed revolutions where effects of major theoretical inventions are visible many years later. For example, it took more than 30 years after that some believed absolutely useless set of equations was devised to construct a working radio transmitter or receiver. It took more than 70 years to apply Einstein's relativity theory to construct the GPS. 40 years after announcement of the idea were needed to implement in practice the carbon fiber, and so on and so forth. So what can we learn from these stories? The answer is quite simple. We should support basic research with public money. Now, to put it simply, science is about turning money into knowledge. And innovation is turning knowledge into money. So innovation can mostly rely on private funds, while science has to be funded with taxpayer money. We have a very good example in Europe. Uh, at the extraordinary meeting of European Council in March, the year 2000 in Lisbon, a new strategic objective called now the Lisbon Agenda or Strategy was coined. The overall ambition for the European Union was to become the most competitive and dynamic knowledge-based economy in the world between the years 2000 and 2010. Lots of money, it was European money, it was spent on projects involving consortia of industry and research institutions, including universities. It was believed that research close to practical applications will push Europe in front of the United States and Japan. But it was soon realized that the strategy had failed. The gap between Europe and the US was even increasing. European policymakers finally learned that the United States had a quite different approach based on using public money mostly to finance the basic research that prepares a fertile ground for innovation in the private sector. Of course, even in the US, are there are some sectors that are financed by taxpayer money, including space, energy, or defense research. So the conclusion was clear. The European Commission decided to create a research funding agency aimed at supporting high-risk, high-gain frontier research. By opening in the year 2007, the European Research Council and allocating around 17% of the total European Commission budget for research to this agency. And the results overpassed the expectations. 
European researchers are closing the gap to those working in the US. And what is very important, the brain drain towards North America had been reversed. 12 researchers funded by VRC already received Nobel Prizes. The example of VRC was followed in some European countries, including Poland, where the National Science Center, and CN funding basic research uh, has been established. We have to remember, remember however, that not everyone likes grant-based funding systems. Some believe that real great scientific discoveries are simply black swans. But it's unexpected findings like those of Galvani, Rentgen, or Becquerel. Therefore, their suggestion is simply to fund researchers without asking them what they are going to do. However, such an approach is obviously not sustainable. Uh, black swan type types discoveries are extremely rare and funding all researchers at generous levels is simply not possible. So we have to choose those projects and individuals that are most promising. It looks, however, that now we have a tool that could facilitate finding those black swans. We can use the artificial intelligence to automat automatically search vast databases to discover strange data correlations or behaviors. It could be a separate line of research to design a relevant, effective, and efficient AI algorithm to do such discoveries. So, to summarize, my conclusions are, are as follows. Taxpayer money should be directed mainly towards curiosity-driven research, and the second, that AI could play a very substantial role in research. Thank you. Thank you very much. And our third speaker here is Professor Lia Moravska, please. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. Dzień dobry Państwu. I'm very privileged to be part of this panel, and this is a very special moment for me, and very touching moment, because I'm, this university is my alma mater, of which I'm very proud. When I first saw the title of our session, I thought this is a very important and interesting topic, but what I attracted my attention was in the title. Is it the crisis in science or crisis about science? Or to be more precise, crisis how we treat science. Just recently, I published a little editorial article titled um, The Age of Anti-Science and What to Do It. It was published in the Clean Air Journal, Journal of the Clean Air Society of Australia and New Zealand. Now, I thought that the reaction to this would be, well, this is not true. There's no crisis. There's no, uh, the age is not of anti-science, or maybe purely this is nonsense. As I was writing this, probes were collecting samples on, the, on Mars. Uh, James Webb Telescope was sending the first images uh, just a few months before the first tourist flight went beyond the boundary of our uh, atmosphere. Vaccin vaccines were discovered uh, and made available for a new pathogen which just came to be. So if anything, one would say this is the age of science. But if we left this room and, say, went outside the street and talked to people on the street, maybe not just here in this very center of Krakow, which is the cultural edu ed educational center of Poland, um, but maybe beyond Wisła, the Vistula River, and talk to people there, we could conduct a little experiment. If we ask those questions, um, have you been vaccinated? Well, um, I bet the response of many of, the, of those people would be no. Why? I don't believe in vaccination. This would be the response of many Poles, I'd say as well. But if we conducted this experiment in many other countries in the world, the response would be very similar. I don't believe. We could continue this experiment and ask different questions. What about climate change? 
the response would be similar of many of the responders. I don't believe. And so on, we could ask other similar questions. Well, um, we could continue with um, other uh, responders, and this is getting even worse. There are many people who have background and education which would allow them to judge perfectly well information which they receive, and yet would say and respond to those questions, I don't believe. And then we could continue with uh, decision makers, politicians, and the response would be maybe not I don't believe, but it would be I don't care or ignore, ignoring this aspect. Yet we are not talking here about religion, which, is fun, which has its fundamentals in belief. We are talking about science, which is based on facts. So this is a very, very dis disturbing situation. Now let me illustrate this with two um, specific examples directly from my area of uh, research expertise. One is in related to uh, um, air pollution, atmospheric pollution, on which, uh, together with my group, we've worked for the past um, well, a quarter of a century, uh, measuring uh, emissions from many anthropogenic sources, many combustion sources, quantifying the emissions, uh, and putting this then into models which our colleagues um, um, used to describe what's happening in the atmosphere. Even a beginner student would be able to understand that while uh, there are things of carbon dioxide, and not all carbon dioxide uh, which is emitted state in the air, and for that matter other greenhouse gases, the majority of it stays there. There are no miraculous ways of removing it from there. And the student would also understand what are the impacts of this on very, based on very simple physics. The uh, IPCC, the International um, uh, Panel on Climate Change, has been progressively updating of what's been happening with the last update, was last year or the year before, um, describing catastrophic changes which have occurred. Um, well, the society is now responding to this, but responding very slowly, too slowly. Are we expecting that this situation with the atmosphere will somehow be reversed in some miraculous way? This is one area, but the one, uh, one example, but the one which is much closer to, to the last uh, two or three years of the pandemic, uh, was the um, realization at the end of March 2020 uh, that the uh, modes of transmission of the virus is completely rejected. The Director General of the WHO announced at the end of, Mar of, of that March that the virus is not airborne, it is wrong. Well, I worked on, in this field for the past 20 years before that pandemic, and I know that it is airborne, like any other viruses and particles emitted from our respiratory tract. So it was wrong. We tried to talk to the WHO, and there was a conversation, but that conversation wasn't going, uh, wasn't going nowhere. Eventually, after three months of extreme efforts, we managed to publish as an open letter to WHO and um, national public health authorities a uh, petition, or however to call this open letter, to recognize the airborne, airborne mode of transmission of this virus. And it was then accepted, accepted by the WHO. But this first three months, when it wasn't accepted, was uh, critical because then the responses of all the uh, national public health authorities formed and the virus was not controlled in the way it should. So, um, we've published this um, uh, conversation with the WHO just two months ago in a publication in the Clinical uh, Infection Diseases Journal, and the title of the publication was COVID-19, 
Science rejected, life lost. Can the society do better? The work by Copernicus, a fundamental work which changed the way we see the universe, was published just a few months before his death. Sometime later, Galileo, Galile, uh, Galileo Galileus was prosecuted and then jailed for continuation of this work. I don't have to worry of being jailed or prosecuted, um, telling the truth about science and about what we are doing. I must say that I was slightly worried about uh, my, our relationship with the WHO because we are WHO collaborating center. Lucky, luckily, the relationship stayed good. Well, another um, risk is that as scientists, we simply won't get money if this, our views are not popular. In uh, 2014, um, a reviewer of one of our grant applications which aimed to continue the work on the uh, principles of uh, particles emitted from the respiratory system into the building and building engineering science stated simply airborne transmission is not possible. Well, we didn't get the money to continue this work. So the risks are not the same as um, in the Middle Ages, but if we are comparing how science is treated, even to an extent, to what was happen happening in the Middle Ages, I must say that there is a crisis about science. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was a very interesting contribution. And as I was listening to all your three uh, expositions, I think I became so overwhelmed by uh, how diverse these approaches were. So our task now will be to somehow come to a, some kind of a common point. And my understanding was, and I, I, could, I could pinpoint the three perspectives as such, maybe tell me if you agree whether I detected your perspective correctly. Professor Craigs was a typical, uh, as I said, historian of science who was trying to convince us that actually uh, it's not much about the revolution. He kind of came out from a very uh, phenomenon of science itself, and how it progresses and how we, uh, with the development of science, we seem to be getting uh, uh, always a greater grasp on the reality. I think that I could summarize this this way. Uh, Professor Yeshtik's approach, I understood, was quite different because, uh, of course, appreciating curiosity, uh, uh, but Professor Yeshtik uh, adverted to kind of more external uh, factors in pushing science, progress of science, the, the funds. That was, I think, uh, the emphasis here went on what are the external, some of the external uh, factors that will assist uh, the progress revolution, uh, revolution in science. And uh, I was, I, as I was listening to Professor Moravska, I, I realized that there's this third very important uh, Issue, uh, yeah, it's back. Issue that is a revolution of our thinking about science, uh, and this is something which is kind of uh, happens exposed. We have science develops, and then we watch what is the social, and what is the social response to science. Because you brought up the question of vaccination, so uh, you know we can rely on the fact that these were done according to scientific legalities, but nonetheless, we faced opposi social opposition. So um, uh, I understand that the revolution about, about science was here, that there, here we look at some kind of aspect of a social uh, perception of science and how, we, how seriously tr we treat what science is telling us. I don't know if I'm pretty much right about your points that you have presented here. So I think these are very three different perspectives. And uh, I would like now to come maybe, uh, if you have a comment to this, how could we kind of start bringing the three different perspectives together? Can we find some common points among uh, what uh, had been said so far? Can we identify some common points? Maybe I can say some words. You know, as when I 
listen to, to those presentations, uh, I think that, uh, anyway, we have, we, we have some, uh, some important points, that is an individual and society, an individual researcher, response of the society, or relation between scientists or researchers, scholars and the society, uh, the, say, conclusions of, of Professor Moravska uh, were rather pessimistic about today's society. I, I think that it's not as bad. Of course, we, uh, a higher percentage of the society is now in, interested in some results of science. In Copernicus times, probably very limited number of people were interested in, in astronomy. Uh, and uh, relation to researchers were, was not really good uh, quite often, uh, even in, say, more modern times, uh, when we uh, remember when Lavoisier was guillotined during the French Revolution because somebody claimed that we don't need researchers. <laughs> so, so maybe it's not as bad now as it used to be. However, we have a problem of of perception of science, its importance is a real one now, definitely. Thank you. Uh, I okay. Can I perhaps say uh, something about the uh, uh, social yeah. Thank you. Uh, development of science all over a very broad period of time, because uh, although science has evolved epistemically with new discoveries and new insights certainly since the days of Copernicus, even earlier, then the uh, drastic changes in the social and organizational uh, dimension of science has been uh, even more marked. And the two, of course, are not two independent parameters that are coupling between them. Uh, but uh, in that regard, the 20th century stand out as a unique century uh, first of all, because um, science became integrated, much more integrated in, in the social and economic life of the nations than before, but also for the simple reason that the number of scientists exploded. Uh, people have calculated or people have recorded the number of scientists, or more specifically physicists, at the turn of the previous century at about 1900. And at that time, the world's total population of professional physicists was about 1,500. Over this century, the number of scientists increased by a fantastic factor of 100, a factor by 100. Just to put it into comparison, the population of the world in the same century increased by a factor of seven. So th there has been this enormous increase in science. Uh, whether this increase has paid off, so, so to speak, in revolutionary discoveries is another question. And let me also add very briefly to another of these uh, social changes that in the good old days uh, certainly Copernicus, but uh, even in the days of Rutherford and Niels Bohr, uh, scientists typically did their work as individuals, helped by a few technicians perhaps, but the papers, they were written by an individual. Einstein, of course, wrote his paper by himself, only by himself. That tradition simply doesn't exist any longer. It has been taken over by teams. Scientists, and especially experimental scientists, works in big teams, corporations, so to, and these may, may be count not only hundreds of scientists, but thousands in some cases. So the phenomenon that is known as big science, which is also, of course, based on very big and very costly machines, has transformed the social dimension of science, but it has not, in my view, transformed um, the epistemic uh, dimension of science. It's, it's, there are things which uh, has been the same over 
centuries, and then there are other things in the social realm that have changed very drastically. I wouldn't say that I was pessimistic. I was realistic. The deep, deep frustration about what's happening in that sense that we have so much science, but we act against the science, that has been the well, feeling of my fellow scientists from many disciplines increasingly more and more. So science is going one way, and what we are doing about science is going the other way. And the, so it's not an academic discussion anymore because we could talk about things whether, well, we understand this is going, this, this has implication, very serious implication on our society. So it's like seeing that a car uh, going fast and without brakes and, nothing's, and nothing's been done about this. This has been the feeling of um, my fellow scientists. And uh, the fact that the society talks about science, this is not changing this. Um, very recently, the Australian Academy of Science proudly uh, stated in some uh, um, publication that never before science was such, uh, so much in the media, in the popular talks. Well, that's perhaps right, but this is not translated into what we are doing about this science. So we see science going this way, but we are going against science. What is the reason for this phenomenon? It's, it's very difficult to tell, and certainly this is outside my area of expertise, why people, younger generation in particular, listen, listening to, well, rumors, face, fake news, but not to scientists. There's plenty of um, information available, yet they listen to other source of, well, disinformation. That's what we were um, um, saying about the WHO. They were spreading the misinformation. And again, uh, when we are talking about different group, which is the politicians, there, there are very different, they are basically self-interest. So all this is very real, very realistic, and not pessimistic, but just thinking how to change it, this is completely outside my, not just area of expertise, but not knowing what to do about this. Uh, any comments to this? I can add just, I think that there is a solution, probably, is education, education, and education. A good quality education at all levels of education. Thank you. Uh, maybe I'll try to push this discussion a little bit into another point of focus, because Professor Jajstyk mentioned here the, the artificial intelligence. And I was just last week at the conference in Warsaw of the Polish Society of Computer Scientists, and it was a big discussion about artificial intelligence. And uh, I must say that I would be first interested in what, uh, in how a historian of science would uh, uh, sort of would comment uh, on the development of artificial intelligence. How this whole thing fits with. Uh, uh, the development of science uh, we've been talking about so far. How would you place the, the, the development of, uh, how would you place artificial intelligence? I, mean, I think this is one of the very important social issues now uh, in, the, uh, in the context of the history of development of science. And then, uh, that's, the, that's my maybe first point. And the second point would be that I've been sort of uh, observing another uh, uh, sort of uh, conclusion that's coming from our uh, our uh, our uh, our talks is that uh, uh, as time progresses from Copernicus, we see more and more people being engaged in science, and from the kind time of Copernicus to our uh, times today, science is really uh, getting a even ever greater impact on society. And I think uh, the reason I mentioned artificial intelligence, because I think uh, at least this is what I have been getting from that conference in Warsaw, was that uh, artificial intelligence is uh, in this sense revolutionary as science because it will affect us as human beings in an unprecedented way. Uh, so, yeah, uh, can we expand on this a little bit, uh, just taking these points into account, how 
artificial intelligence would fit into the history of science altogether, and uh, whether a really artificial intelligence will cause eventually a, a social revolution about science. So by applying your criteria, your point of view to artificial intelligence. Can we expand on this a little bit? I think it's a socially now very important topic. I'm not uh, quite sure what you were aiming at because I, I had probably uh, I had problems with understanding you. But are you speaking of the um, um, the discussion of whether science will come to an end and what science will look at in the future and things like uh, that? Yeah, I mean, my, my basic point was how a historian of science would seize. The, the phenomenon of, of, of artificial intelligence, how it fits together with, with, the, with the with history of science. Where would you place in the history of science artificial intelligence? How does that come in, in, in like the development of scientific thought? Just a few general remarks. Yes, okay, no. Yeah, I, I can add some words about you know, the artificial Intelligence. I, I don't think that it's something that is uh, came out from nowhere. Or mm -hmm. there is some continuity. You know, we during the say progress of the humanity, uh, we developed and the progress of science. We uh, we developed our tools. Yeah? One of the tools was writing. Yeah, some people were afraid of writing. Uh, of writing, Plato, for example. Uh, used to say that we shouldn't teach people to write because people wouldn't memorize if they are able to write. So it's, yeah. But, but <laughs> closing to our, closer to our times, uh, when we look at development of computers, that changed a lot in science, yeah? Because we are able to store and process vast amounts of data. Then development of various algorithms, when we are talking now about, for example, digital humanities, digital history, you know, the ways to compare vast databases, uh, to look for some pieces of information, specific pieces of information. Uh, this is a very important and useful tool. And now we have a next step. A step that is able to intelligently process uh, those, uh, those uh, big databases or data contained in those big databases which help us. I give an example from, uh, I, I had an interesting discussion with a composer, musical composer, a couple of days ago. And he told me, you know, now artificial intelligence is able to uh, compose I asked him if, uh, if he's afraid to lose his job. No, he said, this could only change the way of my work. Yeah? Until now, I have to write an, an individual note while composing a piece of music. But by using artificial intelligence and preparing uh, the relevant uh, algorithms, I can simply ask, uh, a computer or a system to achieve a specific effect. And those nodes will be generated automatically, but the effect I'm asking for is, is my idea. Yeah? So artificial intelligence could change our way of working. It expands our capability. Of course, there are some risks as with every technology. But, yeah. Professor Muravska, would you like to add something on this? I'm sure you would. I, I remember when computers were coming, there were voices that, uh, well, computers will be doing all the job for us and we'll have so much more time. But the real reality, as we all know, is that uh, we have, in fact, much less time. The computers are helping us to do more, and we are doing more, and we have less time. So, in principle, as artificial intelligence should be a tool as you just said, to help us to 
to do more, to do better. And in that sense, this would be very positive. But I think the biggest discussion and the biggest worry is, of which I can have only an opinion, not um, um, any knowledge of this, is whether it will change from being a tool, from being a driver, and will start driving us. So whether that singularity will at some point uh, occur and artificial intelligence will become an intelligence which will be intelligence higher than our intelligence. Whether this is possible or not, as I said, I don't know. But should this happen, then it would be a problem. Uh, okay, I think we have... First of all, Craig, would you like to add something here to the discussion or...? Yes, well... Uh it is true, of course, that uh, for quite a long time, uh, the fundamental sciences, all kinds of sciences, has been increasingly technologized, as it's called. Technology is playing a greater and greater role, and the information technology and computers, uh, an even greater role, um, has opened up for new possibilities and all that. Um, but in spite of all the amazing powers of computer technology and the like, uh, I think it's worthwhile to keep in mind that the basic criteria of what science is and how to distinguish between competing scientific theory has not changed a bit. Uh, after all, science is by its very definition about nature. And in order to, I mean, the, the, the basic criterion going back to Galileo and his, his age is that um, in order to test a theory, that a theory or a prediction should be testable. Not only testable in principle, but it should be empirically testable. So we can ask nature uh, whether a theory is correct or not, and our nature will, uh, will answer uh, and so from that point of view, uh, the massive influence of computer technology uh, is an assistance to the old kind of science, but it's not a radical break with it. Okay, and then would you like to add any comments? Maybe we have time. Uh, yeah, there is, there is a sign that we should slowly come to take the questions from the audience, I understand that we came into really like in theology, we say a nexus mysteriorum, a really a, a very different outlook on what uh, revolution in science may mean. And uh, I think maybe we will have some interesting contributions both from audience or uh, basically quick and quick questions to our uh, to our speakers. Uh, so now. Uh, do we have any questions from audience, please? Now is the time. Yeah, there's a question up there. Marzena Veresa, Warsaw School of Economics. Uh, in fact, uh, after the discussion, I have the impression that we are talking about the crisis or revolution in three areas. In the area of knowledge production, let's say, or knowledge creation, in the area of technology and in the area of social uh, aspects of this of, of the science. Uh, in fact, revolution and crisis are two different things, in my opinion. So, uh, revolution might not necessarily create the crisis, or the crisis might not necessarily create the revolution. So, my question to all panelists uh, is uh, one about these three areas where we can see revolution and crisis, knowledge area, technology development area, uh, in, in particular artificial intelligence and social area. And the second question is about the relation between revolution and crisis. Do you think that revolution could create the crisis or the opposite, it could advance science and find a way to overcome the crisis, as Joseph Schumpeter said, innovation is an act of the creative destruction. So what is your opinion on this? Thank you.
this, this is very true and very good questions. Now, if, I'm not sure whether we should call what's happening now a revolution in science. Many of the innovations, many of the discoveries now in the past could have been called re revolution because they are so revolutionary. But we hear about something revolutionary every second week, every month. So in a way, this is an avalanche of discoveries, of revolutions, of innovation. So that revolution is now um, uh, sort of progressing on an, some kind of an exponential way or something like this. And it's very true, this can uh, cause a crisis or it can help. It should help because we, had, we know so much, it should help. But maybe because there's so much and because the society cannot follow this, and I'm talking like the people on the street, um, and maybe this is causing the crisis. So uh, this is between those two things as I see it. I think that one, one of the problems of revolutions and crises related to science is that they are quite interleaved. You know, when we look at major, uh, say, discoveries, inventions, uh, technological breakthroughs, for example, related to high energy physics, uh, we were able to build uh, a nu uh, nuclear bomb, uh, but we are also able to uh, build nuclear power stations. Yeah, so, uh, so the answers are not, are not very simple because it's, it's about proper use of achievements of science. Uh, of course, it depend, it, it's, it's related to, to anyone. A knife can be used to just to cut bread and, and to kill somebody. So, uh, so I, I think that there is no single relationship, but, uh, but there is a deep, there are deep roots in human minds, human behaviors, in people, in societies, uh, how we use the results of revolution. When we look at proliferation of social media, it's a real revolution, yeah? It and allows contacts between people. It, it, it's absolutely fantastic tool. We can, we, we have, for example, if, if we have uh, some, say, strange or rare hobby, yeah? for example, we are interested in some subspecies of uh, butterflies, uh, and there are only five people in the world interested in, in, in the same topic. Uh, located on different continents, they can communicate with each other by using social media, but at the same time, the social media could be used to spread fake news and so on, and, and uh, destroy, say, uh, some important uh, things in the society. Yeah, so so the qu I, th I think that the question is still open. Any other comments to the question? One point which uh, I completely agree to, but to your previous comment, but related to this is the role of education and perhaps which we, we should think about some different way we teach our kids. And I'm not talking about university students because by that stage it's too late and we are teaching those who are interested in specific topics. We should think about education starting from basically kindergarten and primary school science, the way we teach science uh, and the way we install this knowledge in, into them so they base their thinking on science, not on some other way of um, acquiring information and that's very point. How do you acquire information? That's mm -hmm. something I think is very important. Okay, thank you, Raj. Any other questions from the audience? Yes, we're right here. Yeah, Claudia Dutri. I am uh, just starting activities at the Institute of Economics, Finance and Management at the University of Jagiellonski. I found very interesting the comments of the panel about the crisis, about um, how to understand the position of science in terms of directions that society should take. But uh, if I speak with other colleagues about the results of education nowadays, my impression is that we have a real crisis in terms of the quality of education everywhere. I have been teaching in South America, in Europe, 
and also in other, other countries in other parts of the world. And my impression is that the quality of the understanding of youth mainly and the students that are starting at the university is going somehow down. It's more and more superficial than prepared to understand critical conditions like we have now with the pandemics or climate change. So how can we use this uh, suggestion of our colleague that education, education, education is very important to try to solve the problem with the understanding of society that uh, science is very important if the quality of education is going down? Well, this is completely my observation about the quality of education and from my personal experience when we left Poland for Canada where I worked in the University of Toronto, my older daughter was uh, completed grade two uh, here in, in Krakow. And uh, for the next two years in Canada, she didn't learn absolutely anything new in mass. So this, this, this was for me an eye-opener that, that the education in Canada at that time was nowhere near as good as it was here in Poland. Then we, uh, when we moved to Australia, uh, the level of education between Canada and Australia were very similar. But when I was then coming back to, uh, uh, to Europe, or to Poland, but particularly I had a series of lectures in Austria, and I was teaching on this interdisciplinary topic of air quality and impacts, but starting from physics, to students from different areas of, of the university. And I was worried that they wouldn't understand because I wouldn't probably be able to teach at this level in, uh, in Australia. Here in Europe, the students then were still able to understand regardless of their background. So then in Europe, the level of education, and I'm talking about primary, secondary, was much higher than it was in Australia. From what I understand, I don't have personal experience now um, here, from what I understand, in general, the level of education is going down. My um, sort of suggestion would be, let's look how we taught our kids then, and what has changed, and why that level was much higher then, and it's going down. Any comments to this from other speakers? Yeah, uh, f uh, education systems of education vary from country to country, as, as we mentioned, not only continents, but also within Europe. And of course, it depends on many factors. Some people, especially here in Poland, claim that if we have more money, education would be better. Uh, which is not entirely true, uh, but uh, of course uh, money is needed, that, that's pretty obvious. Uh, however, uh, we definitely we sh should adapt our way how we educate young people to the changes. Uh, it does not make, uh, I think, any sense to teach all of those details that are easily available uh, in the web, so we, we can easily access it, but w we should teach how to connect various pieces of information, how to take conclusions. Uh, we, we should create open-minded people, uh, sensitive, uh, with empathy, and so on and so on. Uh, which, which is an, not an easy task, but it's, it's really important. And of course, we have to teach students how to learn, how to learn individually, how to work in groups on, on different topics. Uh, and of course, it's, 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 it's a difficult task and uh, yeah, it depends on so many factors. And, and these factors are different in, in, in different countries. Thank you. Any other questions from the audience? There's a question right here. I would have a question maybe to Professor Helge Krak. The problem, because we are talking about revolutions in science and using, for example, Thomas Kuhn's idea of paradigm, we have the changes of paradigms. 
in science, but we should probably talk also about uh, changes and revolutions in world images uh, in society, which are not uh, corresponding to what happens in science. And maybe today's crisis could be explained by these two different kinds of movements of, of, of evolution in science and evol evolution in, in popular mind. And maybe this is the problem uh, of, of, uh, of uh, how to, uh, to explain why we have a kind of a social crisis in, uh, with sciences. Well, I think what Professor Liana me means is, is, yeah, he means that, that there is some, the science makes its progress, that's one thing. And the other thing that there is a cer certain social reception yes, of social the results reception. of science, and this is kind of it goes its own way, right? So, uh, discoveries of science will be one thing, and then yes. how it uh, shapes like the average so outlook. So, you should treat differently, separately, what happens in science probably, and what happens in uh, re the reception of science as a kind of uh, popular mind. Uh, of, of uh, humankind. Yes, um, I, I don't quite know, but um, at least uh, one should be aware that uh, these discoveries or, or similar events which we uh, classify conventionally as revolutions, that it's a little arbitrary. Um, other events might be called revolutionary, and indeed, there, as it was pointed out, uh, the very term has been, there has been a certain inflation uh, 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 of it. Um, but as I take it, I mean, there are smaller revolutions, if one can use that term, and then there are the greater revolutions which are concerned uh, with the basic uh, foundation of science and the, uh, the, the, the basic notions such as time and space, I mean, that was the relativistic uh, revolution. Uh, when, whatever we think about, it, 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 it includes notions about time and space, and that were ideas that Einstein uh, redefined, so to speak, and causality was redefined with quantum mechanics and things like that. So therefore, I would classify these two revolutions as, as very fundamental, I mean, very much more fundamental, for instance, than Lavoisier's chemical revolution uh, and even Copernicus's, um, for that matter. But I think it's, it's very hard to make a, a kind of typology of different uh, revolutions, uh, not only because they are different types, but also because they refer to different sciences. I mean, we are speaking about science all the time today, but science as such really doesn't exist. What exists is a number of sciences, and there's a whole lot of, say, botany and high energy physics. They have something in common, of course, and that is why we call them sciences, both of them. But in many respects, they are also very different. Maybe just one more question, if there is one. Well, if there's no more question. I think our time is, has come to an end anyway. Uh, well, I think we just opened up the Pandora's can here. Oh, there is a question. I'm sorry. So that will be really the last one, because we're... I don't want to waste the opportunity to have it set in bright minds here in the front. Um, in terms of uh, revolution of education, which is, our colleagues said that we should change this and that in terms of how to educate our youth. The problem is that our problems in the planet are becoming more and more complex. So this kind of revolu revolution in education should be a very kind of radical revolution. But I don't see this happening right now. Do you have any ideas about this? Frankly speaking, I'm afraid of revolutions, especially social revolutions. You know, I 
used to live in a country where uh, s such a revolution uh, was attempted to be implemented, and uh, and I I really don't want to live another one. So I I think that a steady, uh, well thought evolution is the best. <laughs> well, if that's the answer to everything, then maybe uh, that's a good point to end. Our you know, we, it, it went very broad, as, as broad the topic was, so I think we still have a lot of things left to meditate or talk about during our coffee time, but uh, now I'd like to thank uh, the participants of the panel. Thank you very much for your uh, great contributions, and I think we all had good time in listening to these very divergent views on how you can perceive uh, revolution in science and what are really its different dimensions. And I think what we've learned from here is that we can really indicate a lot of different, very diverse dimensions of the revolutions in science, which happens to lesser or greater degree in our contemporary society. Thank you very much for your contributions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's been a great and revolutionary panel. And now we have some time to exchange our thoughts, opinions, and perhaps doubts. The next point on the agenda starts only at a quarter to three, and it is the second lecture slated for today. I will be here to introduce you to it and the lecture to you. So now let's please enjoy a short coffee break. And once again, I'd like to thank very much the panelists and the moderator. Thank you.